thanks, because my undergrads never applaud me, you know. Uh, so, can you hear me all right? I'm going to be moving back and forth. I used to lecture at 7.45 in the morning, and trust me, nobody sleeps in my talks. So, even though this is right after lunch. So, I'm not a DVM, I just want to say that. I'm actually, my PhD is in biochemistry, and since 1990, I've been on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Nutritional Sciences, um, one of the very oldest programs in the nation, actually. Uh, we discovered a lot of vitamins there at Madison and mineral functions. It's kind of a neat legacy. Um, we work not only with people and their nutritional needs, but everything from cattle. I've published on cats. Um, we do rodents, guinea pigs, and of course bunnies. So it's just uh, natural for us to move into the bunny world, and it's been a reward for me to turn my knowledge base in nutrition into helping the bunnies. And in case you're wondering, I've been bunny whipped since the age of six when my dad brought home a bunny because he had pet bunnies running in the house when he was a boy in the late 30s and early 40s. And when he had kids, he thought this was the right thing to do. And so that's how that all started. And we've had bunnies ever since in the house. So uh, I'll start my timer to try to keep me honest. And by the way, um, a first thanks to I think Mary Huey who put me onto this awesome picture of the bunny putting the cookie back. <laughs> Okay, not. <laughs> I'm putting it back. So one of the things I really want to emphasize for you folks, there is this myth out there in the Google universe, and people like Dr. Oz do not help this. <sighs> Nutrition cannot prevent disease. It will not prevent disease. However, it can reduce your risk or your body's risk for disease but it will never be a 100% cure. And anyone who is telling you this is selling you a, a bill of goods, all right? So I, what I'm gonna give you today are the tools that will let you look at diets and look at some nutritional claims and be able to assess then what's good here and what will help your rabbit in various special needs or in regular maintenance and growth, okay? So first off, now we're going to get a detailed discussion tomorrow um, from Micah about uh, gut physiology and nutrients and, and fermentation and that. So I'm going to assume you know about this today and you will learn, uh, have your holes filled in tomorrow in knowledge. But we are going to go through a few basics first because you can't adapt a diet to a special need until you understand what the regular needs are. So what are the major nutrient types that your rabbit needs? The first is protein. So we have groups of, of people like me, trained scientists, investigators, who are called upon by the government every, depending upon your species, decade or so, to look at the existing data, the new data, and say, what do we think the nutrient requirements are? We do this for humans. In fact, we're in the midst of doing this now for people. Um, unfortunately, because rabbits have fallen off um, the, the research radar, and I don't mean in terms of experimenting on, but I mean in terms of investing federal dollars into rabbit research. So the last time this was done in the U.S. was back in 1973. The Europeans are much more proactive in doing this, bless their hearts, although not always for the same motives that we have. Um, but what I will tell you today is what we do know about the rabbits. And so a rabbit needs 12% of its daily calories as protein. Okay, these are things that are not negotiable. All right. A rabbit needs 12% of its calories as protein. So when you're reading the label, you're looking for 12%. Um, and special circumstances in pregnancy and lactation, you need 18% because you're not only feeding mama, you're feeding the babies and the babies are growing and you're feeding the need to make the milk. The youngsters that are growing need a higher protein content as well because they're making bone, they're making muscle, and they're just growing like crazy, so 16% for them. There are two types of amino acids. You need essentials and non-essentials. Essentials are what the bunny cannot make and must obtain from the diet. The non-essentials are non-essential because the bunny can make those. Now, bunnies are cool in that they eat their poop, right? And so those seagulls, the microbes making the seagulls, because what's in there is mostly microbes, provide the essential amino acids. And this is how wild bunnies 
can eat all this forage and not worry about it. But in order to get those essentials, your bunny has to eat the seagulls, and there are many bunnies that don't. And so we may need to think about that in their diets. And moreover, it's not actually clear that if the bunny is eating a low protein diet, less than 12%, whether the seagulls will adequately meet those needs. So for this reason, I don't recommend a diet that contains less than 12% protein. All right. And of course, if your bunny isn't eating your seagulls, like the uh, engrail, or not engrail, the English white spotting mutation that I'll talk about later, if they're not eating their seagulls, then they absolutely have to have protein from the diet to meet those needs. Um, if the bunny is deficient in protein, the bunny is going to get that protein somewhere. And there isn't a little Scotty beaming protein into the bunny's body. And so where the bunny is going to pull it out of is skeletal muscle. And so you will see muscle wasting and muscle loss. We all see this every time bunny sheds, right? When your bunny drops a little weight when it sheds because now they're pulling muscle protein out to rebuild that fur. Okay, now think about an angora, all right? We'll come back to that. And you need protein not just for muscle, I just want to emphasize you need it for metabolism, for bone, neurotransmitters in the brain. If your bunny has had a wound and is healing or has had surgery, they will need protein to repair those structures. You need it to make blood cells and DNA, yada, yada, yada. It also becomes the primary energy source if you're dealing with a stressed bunny, because under stress, those hormones preferentially pull energy out of protein. Okay? And we'll come, I'll talk about this again later. Dr. Harvey alluded to this as well. But there's always a caveat to everything, because as Thoreau said, moderation in all things. He was a very good nutritionist. And high protein, excessive protein, will encourage the growth of clostridium and E. coli in the gut. So one of the first things I do when people say my bunny has a really messy butt all the time is I ask, how much protein are you feeding? Carbohydrates are not evil. I don't care what Atkins said. He wasn't a very good nutritionist anyway. Actually, he wasn't even a nutritionist. You absolutely need carbohydrates. It is the preferred form of energy that the body burns, okay? Even for bunnies. Bunnies get 35% of their calories from non-carbs, but that means 65% is still coming from carbs. You need it to maintain thermal regulation, to maintain energy at, worse, uh, at rest for all the sprinting and beaking they're doing, um, to run digestive processes, etc. Now, the type of carb can matter. So simple sugars are digested very quickly. You get a very high spike, um, maybe too much insulin, and we can talk about humans and diabetes. But the same thing is true for bunnies, too much sugar, and again, we're feeding, we're feeding the seagulls too much, the seagull microbia. So we want to back off on that. And instead, we're going to emphasize complex carbohydrates because they're digested slower and more efficiently, and less of that is going to reach the seagull. So a, a typical rabbit that weighs 10 pounds is going through about 220 calories a day. I, I, Call it kcals, but you know it as calories, okay? And a bunny is at thermal neutrality, which means it doesn't have to generate excess heat or shiver and the like. Thermal neutrality is 69 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually our home ambient temperature usually, except in my house, we're usually at 65. Um, carbohydrate will meet most of your rabbit's needs and should be about 50% of your rabbit's total calories. So carbs are not evil. Fat, uh, humans actually eat about 30% of our calories as fat. That's, that's fairly high, but that's, we're a different species, okay? And we can handle this, we can manage this fine. Rabbits, though, cannot handle that. And so in general, we're looking at about 3% for a non-pregnant, non-lactating rabbit as their calories, uh, as fat calories. If they're lactating, then we're gonna bump this up maybe to 10%. And even this may be a little on the low side and it may make it higher. It's the triglycerides and the fat that provides the energy, but they also need to be able to make cholesterol to make stuff like vitamin D, to make their cell walls and that sort of thing. Dr. Harvey alluded to omega-3 fatty acids. We don't need these for energy. Your bunny uses these to make hormones, hormones that fight off fever, hormones to, um, uh, uh, run brain function. We had an angora actually that developed an essential fatty acid deficiency due to tapeworm and as we put it, Mo got the stupids. 
And once we figured out, his, his behavior was, was very off. And once we figured out he had a tapeworm and we cleaned that out and we started dosing him with essential fatty acids, he perked right back up again and was back to his normal self. So they need these. There are omega-3s and omega-6s. Most of what's in vegetable oils are omega-6s. Those work fine, okay? Omega-6s are neutral, they're not bad. However, data are showing that omega-3s confer a lot of extra special benefits with respect to immune function, cognitive function, um, lipid control in the bloodstream heart disease. And so I really recommend that you try to identify some sort of omega-3 source uh, to obtain. So good sources of omega-3s, we talked about this, um, the flax seed, but also walnut seed oil, hemp oil, perilla oil as well. Fiber is uh, the source of about 35% of your rabbit's calories from the diet. There are two flavors of fiber, digestible and non-digestible, but what I mean by that is not what the bunny digests, but rather what the critters, the microbes, in the, uh, the, the uh, cecum digest, and that's what that refers to. And so you will see on the label that they do an analysis on that label, and they'll talk about the different types of fiber that are present. Non-digestible fibers are like cellulose and lignin, so the hard, woody stuff of plant matter. Hay provides a lot of non-digestible fiber. And that's really important because it's, uh, it stimulates gut motility, it keeps down clostridial growth, it breaks the poo into smaller pieces, and keeps the gut flowing, all right? Digestible fiber is what the microbes break down for energy, okay? And that's what's now feeding 35% of your rabbit's daily calories, is this digestible fiber. And that's stuff like hemicellulose is the most common. That's also in plant matter. But also pectins, the same stuff we use to make jams and jellies mucopolysaccharides, inulin. And what microbes do is they convert it to very, very uh, short-chain compounds called volatile fatty acids, like acetate, which is just vinegar, or propionate and butyrate. And these are really important not only as an energy source, and they feed the intestinal tract, so the intestinal tract prefers this as a source of energy, but that acid environment also helps to reduce clostridial overgrowth. And so a neat trick, if you're dealing with a bunny who has a lot of um, uh, poop problems and uh, cecal overproduction in that, and I got this trick from Marinelle Harriman, is to pull them off the rich diet, the pellets and the veggies, and feed them hay or straw for three days to try to give that microbiota a chance to rebalance and encourage the microbes that produce the volatile fatty acids. If you've been hearing about in the news, they're starting to talk about poop transplants and microbiome and that sort of thing, right? This is what we're talking about, okay? And that poop transplant is what's happening in the bunny cecum. Now, what about vitamin supplements? In general, they're not necessary. It's more of a selling thing than an actual requirement. If the rabbit's eating their sequels, they pretty much get most of their vitamins that they need from the sequels. But again, the bunny has to be eating them. Most of the B vitamins and vitamin K come from the sequels. And that would be like B1, B2, B5, okay. A couple, though, come from the diet and not from the sequels, and that would be vitamins A, D, and E. Vitamin A from typically foods as a carotenoid, like beta carotene, the famous carrots with the bunnies, but also a lot of plants, green leafy plants are very good sources of carotenoids. Vitamin D, there are two forms. They are both equally fine, all right? There's, there's stuff on the internet, oh, it has to be D2 or it has to be D3, nonsense, all right? D2 is what your bunny will ingest from hays. This is one of the two reasons why farmers dry hay in fields. The other reason is so it doesn't mold. But as that hay is turned over in the field, the light, the UV light on it, converts um, a pro form into a more active vitamin D form, and the rabbits can use this, okay? A good quality pellet will be adding a vitamin D form to it. D3 is what mammals make themselves from cholesterol, okay? Vitamin E typically comes from oils, vegetable oils and seeds and the like. By the way, rabbits can make vitamin C. You don't need to add vitamin C. 
It's a vitamin for humans, it's a vitamin for primates, it's a vitamin for guinea pigs, but bunnies make it just fine. You don't need to feed it to them. And vitamins can be in excess, in to are, are toxic in excess, okay? Minerals. This is something your bunnies cannot get from the sequels and they have to get from plant sources. And so I've just thrown up a list. We talk about major and, and trace minerals, the calcium, the phosphate, but also things like magnesium, sodium, potassium chloride, and then a whole series of trace minerals for iron and copper and zinc for enzyme reactions to, to have red cells in the bloodstream, iodine to make thyroid hormone, um, selenium has, is converted into forms that can be useful antioxidants and the like. There's also a whole series of minerals on the bottom that we think might have roles in the animal and if we pull them out of the diet we start seeing some very odd things going on, um, but we can't right now say that they're required or not. But because of all these different minerals, this emphasizes that no single food, no single plant, or no single vegetable will ever provide all of these. So you cannot feed your rabbits a monoculture diet because it will not contain all of this. So you have to have rich variety in the diet, especially if you choose not to use pellets. So the bunny food pyramid, this is from Kristen Strobel, um, wonderful diagram. Uh, the pyramid, the unlimited grass hay, and then on top of it are fresh veggies. Pellets is a small quantity to assure adequate nutrition and complete, and then treats as the tip on the top. So why is hay important? This is Holly Killer, vampire rabbit from hell. Some of you may have heard about from the uh, uh, internet. She lived with us for many years. She was marvelous. Um, and she loved hay. We miss her dreadfully. Um, the hay keeps the sequel flora in balance, and then as you know that side, and you'll hear more about this tomorrow, the side-to-side -side grinding keeps the molars flat, right, and the fibers push the, the, fiber, the, the fur through the gut because, of course, rabbits can't throw it up, which I guess is great when you're walking around barefoot at night. Um, and then the other really important thing is that, as you know, rabbits are snackers and they're foragers because Unlike us omnivores, we can eat a lot and then we can go without food for quite a long time because we store it very well. Whereas rabbits, as herbivores, are designed to ferment constantly, so they always have to be filling this fermentation vat called a cecum. And so their, their physiology and their brain is set up to snack. And so the wonderful thing about hay is this is a very low calorie way to snack all day. Um, it's, it's, you know, celery sticks for humans, right? So what type of hay should we use? This is a question that's asked a lot. Grass hays are best. They are lower in protein and calcium. I live in Wisconsin, the dairy state, and so most of our hay, of course, is alfalfa because it's high in protein and calcium, and the cow is excreting this as milk. So what you need to find, though, but bunnies can't do that unless they are lactating and pregnant, um, is find a grass hay. In the West, they grow a lot of Timothy hay, and so that's just been really commercialized. If you drive around out west in Montana, you'll see hay grows and is harvested even along the interstates and in the interstate medium. It's, it's really something. But there are a lot of other grass hays that are terrific. Bluegrass, brome, fescue, I've listed a few here. And again, if you're choosing to feed no pellets or very little quantities of pellets, mix up your hays because they all have different nutrient and micronutrient contents. So to round out the diet better. Um, but if you can't find grass haze, it's okay to feed alfalfa and clover. Maybe that's all you have access to because any hay is better than none. All right? But we tend to use this more for growing bunnies. The first cut, you may have heard of first cut, second cut, usually happens in June-ish, depending upon where you live. In my area, it's about the 15th to the 20th, and then we get a second cut in September. Uh, if you think about it this way, in first cut, the plant is busy making flowers and seeds, right? So first cut tends to be a little lower in fiber because the plant's busy making protein and seeds, and so it tends to be richer in nutrients. So for a maintenance hay, and if you really have a rabbit that's struggling with weight or is struggling with protein issues or that, you may want to play this game. Second cut will have a lower nutrient density. And they're both fine, and I don't care which ones mine get because I know we can balance the diet out through other ways. If you have trouble locating A, this is why every state has a county agricultural specialist. Okay, I'm sorry, vendors, I'm sorry, I'm a professor in an ag school. 
And so we use our extension agents extensively. They are paid to know who's growing what. Farmers need to know what they're growing. They are sending samples out to the state for analysis. They can tell you exactly what they have. And my recommendation is if you want to buy local, I also support local, um, go to the farm, buy a bale, open it up, smell it. If it's green and fresh and wonderful, terrific, you can buy more. If it's crummy, then you just leave it there and you're out two bucks or four bucks or whatever. That's what it costs in my neighborhood. It's a dairy state. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> so what hay can't do is remember its, its nutrient composition also reflects the soil, and so it, may, it won't provide a full range of nutrients. You can't have a 100% hay diet. It, for the long term, it just is inadequate. All right. So pellets, pros and cons. This is Tinker, <laughs> who discovered the bag of food that we kept in the other room to feed the 10 baby bunnies, and <laughs> which were not his. <laughs> He's like, hi, Mom. <laughs> Look what I found. <laughs> it's so funny. All right. I am not anti-pellet. There are good reasons to use them, and you want to think about whether this is something that you want to recommend or not. It's easy and convenient. As a nutrition professional, I can watch, and I see that most people don't feed themselves correctly. So what makes me think they will feed their rabbits correctly? <laughs> Sorry, I'm being blunt. <laughs> and, and honestly, that bunny depends upon you to get it right. They are your ward, and they trust in you to do it right. So you need to do it right. The, what pellets do do, a well-designed pellet ought to provide complete nutrition, and this is especially true now you understand for vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids. However, there are downsides. It is very, it's, it's nutritionally dense, much denser than a rabbit would eat in the wild, right? So you can't feed it unlimited. It has to be rationed. It's high in calories, it's high in protein and calcium. So you need to think about how much do they need daily. Um, it lacks some of the benefits of hay, the long fibers, okay, the snacking urge, it doesn't meet that, the fresh veggies and the water they bring in and the fresh tastiness, like it's boring eating the same thing every day, even if for me it's popcorn. So, you know, there's, there needs to be some variety there, that's very helpful. There are different pellets for different life cycle stages. So these are the 10 babies that Tinker was stealing their food. Anna came to us, I named her after Anna and the King of Siam. Um, she came to us skin and bones, but she was clearly pregnant. We had to go on a trip and told the sitter, don't worry, and two days later she emailed us, calls us and she says, there's 10 babies in that nest. And she kept every one of them. Wow, it was amazing. So they will support the babies to the expense of their own muscle mass. So for pregnancy and lactation, she needs a lot of energy. She needs a lot of fat and protein and calcium. So something like what used to be called Purina Red Bag. You're looking for a lactation breeder chow, okay? But that's gonna have the high fat and protein and calcium and energy that you need. And I feed them to mom and babies till about six to eight weeks old. I notice that babies stop nursing around week five, mom starts getting tired of this. This is also a terrific diet to use if you have, especially like an elderly bun or a bunny that can't maintain weight. So cancer or starvation, you know, a rescue that needs nutriture or elder buns. You know, at that stage, at, at their age, they get to be 10 or 11, well, they can eat whatever they want. I hope somebody lets me do that too if I get to 80, you know? So another type of diet is called growth. And this is different from pregnancy and lactation. It's gonna be a bit lower in protein, um, lower in energy density and fat. It was developed to put meat on rabbits. But you know, we're not using it that way. We're using it for the special purpose of trying to help rabbits to grow adequately and gain weight. So it has an intermediate density. They're typically alfalfa based because that's a good way to get higher protein and calcium in. They're terrific for litters. I, I switch to this at about six to eight weeks of age to uh, let them gain their muscle mass. Again, if you've got a bunny who has a thinner muscle mass, but they're not so emaciated, you're not comfortable with a lactation diet, this is a terrific choice. What they used to call green bag, and now it's Purina Complete. And then there's maintenance pellets, and when I first started in House Rabbit Society, now, oh my God, 21 years ago, right, Julie? <laughs> oh my gosh. 
Um, we didn't have a maintenance diet except for a lab chow, okay? But on the other hand, we had a lab chow. And the advantage was that these are extraordinarily well characterized. And when you buy a lab chow, because it's going into scientific research, these folks are responsible to the National Institutes of Health because if you F up your diet, they're coming down at you like a ton of bricks because you just squandered federal resources. So one of the things I love about a lab diet, and that's why what I use, um, is that I know what will be in that bag every time. There were no melamine incidents in uh, a lab chow diet. That happened a couple years ago. Um, Purina Fiber 3 is the spin-off of that as they went, oh gosh, wow, there's a market for this. And so they took their PMI lab chow, which is here, and they relabeled it and refortified it a little bit for the pet market. Tech Lab, which is actually based in Madison. A lot of our former students go work there. Um, also has a very similar product. But now there are newer maintenance pellets, as other people have, have realized, that we are a huge audience for this, so hurrah. So now we have things like the Oxbow BBT was one of the first, American Pet Diner, um, uh, the KT, Carefresh, et cetera, et cetera. These diets will have the lowest nutrient density, and, and they're designed to maintain body weight. That's why they're called maintenance. So these are for non-growing animals. But again, you want to refeed it in a restricted manner. It's impossible, of course, to eat too much. So what you should be looking for in a pellet is somewhere between calcium that's between 0.6 and 1.2%. Calcium requirement on a rabbit is 0.6%. If the bag says less than 0.6%, I get nervous. Personally, I don't buy it. Pro, and I'll talk about calcium in a bit. Protein between 12 to 14 percent. And again, if it's less than 12 percent, I get a little nervous. And fiber, I like personally like to see more than 20 percent. Okay. Because we imprecisely know rabbit micronutrient requirements, expect to see these diets continue to be fine-tuned over the years as we learn more and more about it. So how do you read an ingredient label? So here's an example of two diets. And um, in the blue are the macronutrients. And so a diet is going to show you the percentage minimum of protein. We were talking earlier, the UK and the EU have different standards for labeling than the US does. And I'm going to talk about US requirements. One, uh, comparing just two diets, I grabbed um, one is at 14%, one is at 15%. On the right, I've got the requirements, so they both meet that. Crude fat minimum, we think should be about 3%, the minimum is 1.5% or 2%, so that's you know, close. Um, I'd like to see the fat bumped up a little bit, but then I don't know what the high end is. You see, you're driven here by US regulations on what they're gonna put on the label. They're not gonna volunteer more information. Uh, minimum and maximum ranges, and then sometimes they'll give you the moisture content. Here's the calcium minimum to maximum. You can see one is under and one meets. By diet, uh, diet two meets the requirement or exceeds. Um, phosphorus, they'll give you phosphorus, but the reality is, is in rabbits, unlike other mammals, the, the ratio of calcium and phosphorus aren't linked together in terms of absorption. So I don't get worried about what the phosphorus number says because I know the rabbit's gonna get a lot of phosphorus from the diet anyway, from the plant matter and the phytate. And rabbits can have phytase, so they, they can take it all out of there. Um, and then some salt in there, salt, is, is not evil, you do need some salt for palatability, but also because you need to maintain osmolarity, especially if you live in a hot temperature and your rabbits are exposed to a lot of heat. Um, sometimes they'll give you some minerals. And in the green, I've shown you the vitamin content on uh, the vitamin A line. I wanna point out that the requirement for vitamin A is 6,000 IUs. You can see the second diet is at 10,000 IUs, which in my mind is, is high. Um, but on diet one, you can see that's 19,000 IUs, and I would love to see that dropped because high vitamin A levels are actually hepatotoxic. Um, and there have been studies actually come out of my department showing this, and a lot of manufacturers have now dumped down the vitamin A content in their foods. So nutrient needs vary by body size. You may kind of notice this, but not fully aware. And so tiny rabbits, um, <laughs> that's a coffee mug, um, have a much shorter gut compared to their body size and a faster metabolism. 
as compared to a large rabbit, and so they need more energy per pound of body weight, both to extract out nutrients, because a short gut is less efficient, and because they're burning through calories a little bit faster. Contrast a large bunny, that's Ms. Lucy there with George, she was a big flemmy. Um, they have a much longer gut and a slower metabolism, so pound for pound they need less energy. So how much should you feed? These are the standard HRS guidelines that I guess I may have had a hand in many years ago. It varies completely. Listen to your rabbit. Your rabbit is your best judge of how much to give. Some rules of thumbs that are on the HRS website. I'm not going to read this. But the most important message is to listen to your rabbit and then adjust the diet. And this is because most pellet manufacturers won't give you the digestible energy and you don't actually know the calories per gram or, or cup or whatever. And here's just an example. I took this measuring cup and I weighed out um, a quarter cup of two different pellets. And pellet number two weighed 20% less than pellet number one. Wow. And that was a quarter cup exactly for both. Okay. So each pellet is different and you have to adjust to what you're using. How are pellets made? There are open and closed formulas. Most are closed formula, which is to mean that they will not disclose what's actually in it. By law, they're required to give you what's on that label that we went through, but they won't give you the complete formulation. The other reason I use lab diets is because I do get the complete formulation from them. And I know enough that I want to look at that label in detail. Um, but there will be flexibility in the label. You need to understand that the composition, is, it will say, may contain in some order. Um, what is actually in there often depends upon the market conditions and what's available. You know, right now, all the corn is going to ethanol, so less corn is available, and so they're adjusting to maybe have more soy or more wheat or that sort of thing. So it all depends upon what's happening in the ag market. And so keep that in mind. Most diets are excreted to form those pellets, which means that under high heat or pressure, they're shooting out of a little nozzle to make that pellet shape. Ah, but that high heat denatures the grain, and that's good because it makes it more digestible. So I see on the internet people are going on about, oh, corn is terrible. Well, it is in big pieces, but in the pellet, it's ground and denatured through the extrusion, so it's perfectly digestible. And the same thing is true for the soy protein and wheat protein, et cetera, et cetera, okay? There may be a binder to reduce dust. That's okay. And they may, I hope there's an antioxidant in there to reduce spoilage. Um, what I want to point out when you're looking at the label, the way to read a label is that the ingredients are listed in order of abundance, the most to the least. And that'll be your clue to understand what's in there when they list that composition. So I'm just going to flip one here to you. In blue, I highlighted what's providing energy. And uh, the soybean is the fatty acids. And everything in green are the vitamins and minerals. And those are huge words, but they're very precise. And I like precision because then I know exactly what's in there. So none of these are toxins or anything like that. These are the vitamin and mineral names. So I like to see that, okay? Um, just some nutrition myths. Soybean is bad, no. Um, it's a complete protein. It's de it is denatured in the processing. It can also contain natural phytoestrogens. Those of us who are enjoying menopause may take advantage of this. Um, it actually is more digestibility than sunflower than ground peas, than barley, than wheat, or alfalfa, all right? So don't believe everything you read on Google University. Or conversely, corn is bad. It does have lower digestibility, but we're adding it for protein, or for energy, because it's a lousy protein source. But it, again, it's very finely ground. You're not gonna see the corn chunks. I hope you don't see the corn chunks in the pellet. If you do, don't buy it. Um, wheat is good or bad depending upon your you know, view, but I, as far as I know, rabbits do not have gluten intolerance, so I don't worry about this, and it has very high digestibility. And we talked about vitamin D. So diet summary on the left, we've got uh, nutrient intake. Half of the calories is carbohydrate, but we want this to be complex carbs. And then a third to be fiber metabolites, about 10, 12% protein and 3% fat. 
So then when we look at food intake now, the vast majority is going to be hay, followed by pellets, a small amount, of, or followed by veggies, excuse me, followed by a small amount of pellets, and un poco treats. Remember, mental treats is a mental construct. You define what a treat is. In my house, treats are veggies. They get a big plate of them, but they're still treats because they're yummy and we love them. Okay, special diet needs. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things. Life cycle changes, weight loss, obesity, gut problems, some genetic breed issues, and then I want to end up by talking about calcium and renal failure. Um, Joy is actually the expert on pregnancy and lactation, a lot what I learned from her. Um, you can see this is a three-week-old baby Dutch bunny, and you can see he's already helping himself to the pellet bowl and the oatmeal that we put in there as a boost for energy to give him more protein and calories and the like. Babies actually start sampling solids at three weeks. You want to keep the babies in with the mamas, of course, right? Because not only do they get that yummy good milk, they're also getting vaccinated, if you will, with mom's microbiota. So you want bunnies to get their sequels. So don't clean those poops out so fast. Let the bunnies sample and nibble them so that they make their own sequel microflora. Okay? Very important to get. And if you don't have a mommy, then put them in with someone who can give them that material because they won't really colonize it on their own. It has to come from a source from somewhere. Introduce veggies slowly. Give them gut microbiota a chance to start adapting. In Wisconsin, legal age of weaning is eight weeks, and so I take that to heart in the sense that I don't, you know, I make sure mom's around then, though she may be getting really tired of this by then, and is usually kind of shoving them away. Um, I like to boost with oatmeal, um, but again, unlimited pellets. And then if you have the option for a breeder or lactation pellet, that's the one period where I really try to go for that sort of diet. Um, this is from, I think, this is either Joy or Donna's recipe. You guys correct me. Um, a, a nice substitute for rabbit milk. It's not perfect by any means, but a cup of KMR, a tablespoon of heavy cream, an egg yolk that um, does not have salmonella, please and then maybe a quarter cup of corn syrup. Um, George, do you remember the name of the company now that makes special animal milks? Pardon? Foster, yes, that's it, thank you. And so that, they also have a really good quality milk that more matches exactly what they're doing. Uh, rabbit milk is actually very, very low in sugar, which is another reason you don't wanna feed regular cow's milk is very high. It's about 10 to 15% fat, so it's richer in fat and very rich in minerals. So geriatrics, um, Dr. Harvey talked a lot about this, and I'll just supplement some of the things she said. It turns out that as we age and as our bunnies age, the neurons that regenerate for our olfactory and taste, they, they lose their ability to regenerate, and so we lose our ability to taste with age, and so do the bunnies. And what we've learned to do is to be super flexible in our food choices, and we tend to emphasize strong flavors to try to compensate for that loss, uh, which then could would contribute, right, to a loss in appetite, because gosh, that food doesn't taste as good as it used to. Um, so we would rotate, and we had a, a little bunny, that an elder bunny, she was about 12, and we fed her KT exact kibble because A, she really liked it, she had a lot of calcium problems. But one week she'd eat the yellow pieces, and the next week she'd eat the green pieces, and then it was the red, and then she'd go back and forth. I was fine with that because, you know, this was just, you know, older ones can do what they like. And the same week, one day the, the broccoli florets were great, and next week she liked the stems. And, you know, I was flexible. You know, as long as she was eating, I was happy. With the loss of muscle mass, this is very difficult to, to address because it's largely hormonal in origin. And you can't really address the hormonal piece, okay? But what, because they're losing insulin-like growth factor, they're losing growth hormone. But what we can do is try to increase their access to protein and energy, and energy in particular, so that they're not as likely to draw on their muscle mass, especially if they're shedding. You can feed them higher protein, what they can handle, because of course you don't want to induce uh, cecum overgrowth, right? So you're going to be balancing. So maybe you can't get as much high protein, but maybe you're going to supplement with something like oatmeal, which has a lot of fiber and a lot of energy, and maybe that's helpful. I like extruded kibbles for my elder buns because it has even higher nutrient density, um, and it seems to just have an extra flavor boost. 
Um, a lot of veggies. I can think about my bowl height. Can they still reach in the bowl? We had an elder bun who couldn't get into the bowl anymore, so we'd scatter the pellets on the floor and they could go for it that way. And we talked about pain management. So this is Puck. This is an example of rescue extreme weight loss. Um, you can see that this is uh, Puck, and then Puck after we did the butt baths, so you could really see the body shape. He had a hell of a lot of problems. He had bone degeneration. You can see how malformed the spine is. Um, we gave him ad lib food. His owner fed him dog food. Um, she was a mentally disturbed individual. She'd go to the pet store and buy a pet, and Renee remembers this, and then feed it all sorts of horrible things, and then it would die, and then she'd go get another one. Um, on this particular rabbit, what was happening is we were in liver and kidney failure. Um, we tried to feed Ed Lib, but there just wasn't the body mass anymore to maintain cardiac function. Not only was muscle wasted, but the heart was wasted as well. Um, we had that bunny about a month, and we just were not able to reverse. You see that bunny, though, has no fat mass either, right? That means this bunny cannot thermoregulate. This bunny was on a heat lamp. This bunny had a heat pad where he could move on and off of it as he wanted to, so that we could not lose energy by shivering. I mean, I might have even made a little knit jacket. In fact, I think we looked for one for this one, and, and we couldn't find a dog jacket on the right size to put on him. I think his actual problem was a copper deficiency. He looks very much like a copper deficient rabbit, and that would have been challenging uh, to deal with unless we had had more time. And then again, you're going to need to balance gut problems against their protein energy needs. So extreme weight loss can have a number of causes, cancer, this malnutrition, but geriatrics, if they're immobile or have reduced mobility, they start losing muscle mass, diabetes, renal failure, fever. So you want to be adding calories and protein to the diet. Switch to an alfalfa clover hay, okay? Deal with the calcium later. They really need the protein and the energy in at this point. And seagulls from a healthy rabbit, because if they're malnourished, they may not be getting the good sequel balance, and they may benefit from healthy sequels. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. These are on the internet, but, uh, on the HRS webpage. But members have developed, like Nancy LaRoche, some wonderful um, high energy diets that work really, really well. I wanted to mention infections because Dr. Harvey pointed this out, and I wanted to add that. When you're running a fever, when a bunny's running a fever, most of the energy does not come from fat. It comes from protein. This is why people lose a lot of muscle mass when they're very ill with fever or the like. And so you need to feed a fever with protein as well as calories and energy okay, to counteract that. The other thing is when you have a bunny like Puck, that rabbit is too sick to mount an immune response and to mount an infection response. And it may be that when you feed the bunny, you also feed the infection. So you need to be aware that this rabbit, a week down the road, may suddenly erupt with a massive infection, a bacterial infection and symptoms and the like, because the thing was suppressed. Um, we see this in children all the time when you do third world rescue and refugee work. And it certainly is true in the rabbits as well. This is one of the things I love about my job. I can just move from people to bunnies, and, and what's relevant is often crossing borders. Um, obesity? Is this rabbit obese? <laughs> Yay, everyone agrees. Oh yeah, RC was in bad shape. So this is my starving artist version of what a bunny should look like versus an obese, and Bob drew a much nicer picture of this for the handbook. Um, what I recommend new owners to do is to always photograph the rabbit from the side and above when you get them. And this is because bunnies don't wear trousers, even Dutch bunnies. And so you can't tell when that waistband is getting thick. And so we have to do it for them. And so posting those pictures in a prominent place makes it much easier to see if the weight is starting to slip on. Just like people, right? No, we don't have this problem. Um, but you can see in bunnies in particular, where does the fat mass go? Up along the back, on the chest, underneath. We should have a nice, beautiful curved bunny should have a waist. And fat bunny had no waist. So why, why is obesity dangerous? Well, many of the same reasons as in humans, but also some other things. And number one is they can't clean themselves, right? And you know, I have better things to do than to get butt baths every morning. So messy butt and urine scald are real issues. Bunny needs to get back there to clean. But as some other things you may not have considered, the abdominal fat will put pressure on the cecum. 
and prevent the cecum from doing its job efficiently, so maybe that creates more messy butt um, and impedes digestion. But it also contributes to heart disease. We just lost a, an old, very elder man to heart failure. He wasn't fat, but he absolutely had atherosclerosis. Bunnies certainly get this. Um, hypertension. It also can cause fatty liver disease, which if untreated is fatal, and you want to avoid that. It also makes them think about it. They can't posture correctly with all that fat, and they can't evacuate the bladder completely, so they're now they're at a much a higher risk for urinary tract infections and for calcium sludge. It makes the anesthesia unpredictable because anesthetic moves into liquid, to water, and fat differently, and every vet, okay, thank you, every vet will tell you that they hate operating on an obese rabbit because it makes it hard to know how much anesthesia to use, and more importantly, how long it will take them to recover. And also it puts pressure on joints, especially for huge breeds. You know, they're not meant to be that big anyway, and their joints are already under pressure. Sorry, Kelly, <laughs> but it was such a great photo. <laughs> Food is not love, right? Love is love, love is love. So treating obesity, <clears throat> um, record all food intakes for one week. I mean all food intakes, all food intakes, including all the snacks. Only one person feeds the rabbit. Our rabbits are really good with Academy Awards for I'm starving, I'm gonna <laughs> die, I'm kicking up, you know? And, and then, you know, George comes in and he, he says, did you just feed them? And I go, yeah, he's like, got me again, you know? <laughs> we always, 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 always use a measuring cup. Always, always, always. You know, buy a set, they're three bucks and throw most of them away, but keep the quarter cup or whatever, okay? And we're talking about a level measuring cup, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You can increase veggies, grass haze, you know, substitute for low-calorie Timothy pellets, all that good stuff. You know the drill. You're aiming to lose one or two ounces a week. This is not a crash diet. We are not doing Atkins. We are not doing all that nonsense, which doesn't work permanently anyway. Um, you're looking for a slow, steady change. You don't want to induce, for example, fatty liver disease, which you could do by losing weight too quickly. Make sure before you start this or early on that you have your vet check liver and kidney enzymes to make sure the rabbit is capable of managing this caloric restriction. And then encourage exercise, make finding food fun. Um, I love those plastic treat balls where there's a little hole. We don't use them for treats, we use them for pellets. And we put the pellet ration in there and put it on the floor and they have to scoot it around and damn if he's not exercising at the same time they're eating, you know, I love it. So losing weight safely, this is Sprecher. Yeah, oh my God. Uh, she w I mean, she'd hop and she did the wave, you know? It was, uh, but this was her first, I plotted her first month of weight loss, and you can see she went from 10 pounds to a little over nine pounds over four weeks. It was beautiful. Um, so, and what we were giving her, she was started out at 10 pounds, but she was not a 10 pound rabbit. And we gave her an eighth cup pellets twice daily with all the hay that she could eat. And we were targeting seven to eight pounds for her. Now, is this bunny obese? No. You are right. Yay, you guys must be rabbit educators and experts. <laughs> so this is Tinker, and you can see right away the problem, right? He's actually got no muscle mass, and he's got a distortion here. What it, what's going on with him, do you think? Uh, liver disease, cecum. Yep, yep, it's, it's, it's a cecum. He has an enlarged, impacted cecum. We got him, and the owners who abandoned him said his favorite food was McDonald's french fries. Oh. They didn't lie, it was, too. <laughs> okay, so we had a hell of a time adapting his diet because his cecum was completely insane, you know, which it was really tough to get a reset back. So messy butt is due to cecum overproduction. Um, feces smeared on hindquarters, you kind of know about this. What I really want to talk about here um, is, whoops, I'm going to cut ahead, but um, will be English white spotting. So I'm going to come back to the cecum issues in a moment. So breed specific problems, angoras, oops, so we have, you now understand why with angoras, I always feed them unlimited pellets. I've never had a fat angora and I've had many. Um, they just need that protein. They are built to put protein into fur, and fur is 100, basically 100% 100 protein, and up to 30% of their body weight can be grown as fur. 
we underestimate how much fur they're making. Unless you have one, <laughs> you get it. And they will make fur at the expense of muscle. So if they don't get enough food and enough protein, they're pulling it out of muscle. So on my angoras, I actually always feed them a uh, uh, alfalfa-based diet, unless for some reason they can't handle the calcium. Um, I'll skip that here. Um, what I just said. Okay, so Rex breeds, they, they get fat by breathing, don't they? <laughs> One day we will know what that mutation is. I don't know what it is. I think it's linked in some manner to the way that, oh, this is, plug your ears if you don't want to hear this. Um, because they're a pelt breed, there's something that they, um, I forget what it's called, when they, they ration the food at the very end to reduce the fat that's attached to the skin and it changes the color and the skin. And I think that that process is selected for some mutation in energy metabolism. The consequence, though, for us is that Rex's gain weight by breathing. <laughs> and so what we do is we always feed him less per pound than I would a bunny that isn't a Rex. So you are not imagining this. And this is true for the minis as well as the bull Rexes. And I absolutely use a measuring cup on Rexes. So this is a good weight, and that's a bad weight. Um, and that's what I just talked to. Giant breeds, um, they just have the same nutrient requirements as everyone else, except there's been studies with dogs. You know how dogs, especially big breeds, have hip problems. And I'm extrapolating from the dog studies. But what we know is when dog, especially big breeds, grow too fast, their joints don't grow correctly. And they are at higher risk for hip problems. So what Purina and other companies, Science Diet, I think in particular, have been doing, excuse me, is to um, put them on a much lower calorie diet to slow their growth trajectile, to give the hips a chance to grow properly. And I'm just taking a page from that leaf without any real science behind it to suggest that maybe with the large breeds we should think about doing something similar rather than what the breeder mentality would be to do to make them as big as fast as they can, is that we should ration the food. Even they'll grow up to 18 months of age, that we should ration the food with them and kind of slow this trajectory out to give them a chance. All right, I want to talk about English white spotting and I want to talk with calcium and I'm afraid I'm going to run over. <laughs> These are things I really wanted to talk about. So what is English white spotting? You've probably been hearing about this on the internet and allusions and that. This is the gene that causes spots in bunnies and it's called white spotting because they're turning black spots into white spots. Oh, so this bunny is covered with spots. They're just white on a white background, so you can't see them. <laughs> True story. It's a dominant gene. And so bunnies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven have one copy of this gene. Bunnies eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 have two copies. And so more of the black spots are turned to white. They're also known as Charlies, or in, in, you know the full bloated English spots. This occurs on a variety of breeds. Okay, you need to understand this. You will see it on Rexes, on Hotos, English Spots, Rhinelanders, in Lops, in Satins, in Rexes, okay? It's not a breed in of itself, it's just a gene. But what it does, you'll see this at some point in this rabbit's life, you'll probably get really funny poops that are really big, or they're globby, and there are a lot of poops sticking together, and these are not seagulls. These are poops, but this is not diarrhea. What it is, is that these rabbits cannot pull water out of the feces correctly. And so the feces have a higher moisture content. They also have a lot of trouble, yeah, I'm going over. <laughs> um, they have uh, also will, are likely to have an impacted cecum. And so their cecum stops working. And what has happened is this mutation prevents the nerves from connecting into the gut to innervate the gut correctly and propulse the muscle waves that are needed to move foods and materials in and out of the cecum and down the large intestine. Okay. These rabbits may be deaf because it's the same mutation, but they are at high risk for stasis, for cecal impaction, for gut rupture, and eventual mortality. When I get them, we don't adopt them out anymore. It's typically treated with a stressor. It tends, the treatment right now is palliative. We don't have a good treatment. It sounds like there's something coming out that's increasing the protein content to compensate 
for the cecal imbalance. I would feed these rabbits a pellet diet because they're not making cecals. So they need the vitamins, they need the minerals, they need the essential amino acids. Um, gut stimulants, medications, lactulose to keep the gut hydrated, even though you think that their feces are too moist, but you want to keep the cecal material moving. Um, exercise. I want your poop if you have one of these bunnies. Thank you for the folks who brought it. We're planning a study in collaboration with UW Vet School to look at these in detail. So if you have some, a bunny like this, come talk to me. The last thing I want to talk about, if I may, is calcium, can I? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Mom isn't here, okay, I got her blessing. <laughs> calcium management in rabbits. Um, it's, it's about four more slides. The problem with rabbits and calcium is that <sighs> calcium is soluble in acid, right? Which is why we use vinegar to clean our hot pots. But rabbits don't have an acidic urine. They have a very basic urine, so the calcium precipitates out and forms sediment. Rabbits vacuum up from the gut all the calcium they can get their, their mouths into, unlike humans, okay? And rabbits don't send it out, the, the bile and the poop, the way that most mammals do. They excrete it out the urine. So they got three strikes against them. So not surprisingly, rabbits are at higher risk for calcium problems. Rabbits also can have very high serum calcium and their bone turnover, however, we have to say is really, really fast. They have these teeth that are growing all the time. So they actually, unlike ours, so they actually have a high calcium need. So what's true for other species with calcium isn't necessarily true for bunnies. I also want to point out that the issue, the relationship between calcium in the diet and calcium in the urine is complicated. So we took a bunch of our foster bunnies and we collected their pee and we spun it out and we measured how much of that urine volume is calcium solids, up to 50%. Wow, huh? Versus urinary pH, zero relationship. All these rabbits were fed exactly the same diet. Wow. Guess what? Urinary calcium has nothing to do with what you're feeding the rabbit. Uh, I've been saying this for 10 years and nobody believes me. There's the data. And you know which rabbit had the calcium problem? This bunny. <laughs> the bunny with the lowest serum calcium. That was the rabbit that had the calcified kidneys and had the big bladder stones. Whoops. What's going on? Think what's happening is the upper rabbits are doing it right. They are sending the calcium into the urine the way they're supposed to. If the rabbit is not sending the calcium into the urine, it's getting stuck in the kidney. And the kidney is not doing its job. That's the rabbit I worry about. The other thing I want to mention is work from Dr. Harcourt Brown. And maybe you've seen this. And she looked at serum calcium levels in domestic pet rabbits in England. And she looked at serum calcium. These are the rabbits with advanced dental disease. They had the lowest serum calcium level. Then the rabbits with early dental disease. Rabbits had higher levels who lived in a hutch and were healthy, no dental disease. And then these were the free range bunnies were running around outside that were pets. So the bigger dental disease is associated with lower serum calcium, not more. She would argue that reducing calcium below requirements increases the risk for bone disorders like dental disease. And this is the opposite of what we've been telling people. Because we think that what happens in mammals is also true for rabbits. And then here's parathyroid hormone, which controls your serum calcium levels. Dental disease had the highest levels, and then as the rabbits got healthier, the levels were lowest, and parathyroid hormone is what signals to say we're calcium deficient. The job of the hormones is not to put calcium into bone. The job is to put calcium into the blood. And if you don't have enough calcium coming into the blood, they're gonna pull it out of the bone, and they're gonna pull it out of the teeth. This is not good for the rabbit. So by restricting the diet and the calcium with the sludge, we may be defeating our own purposes and making the situation worse for better because it's a Band-Aid that is not treating the true problem of why this rabbit is having problems with stones. 
Okay, so I'm just repeating what she said. What I want to highlight that diets, I just went out and six different diets, the calcium levels are all over the board, and some of them aren't even telling us their content. And then I'll have to wrap up. So, in, in, in this I case, I'm, I agree with what you just said um, because I've been listening. Yeah. Um, and so, how I get passionate do you on this one. Talk to people about how they should go ahead and uh, increase that calcium. And what advice do you give for safely increasing calcium? I, I tell them to go to the NRC requirements. There's a, if they're a requirement for a reason, you cannot break the laws of nature. You can't. I mean, sorry, this is how the rabbit is made. Okay, um, so I have gone way over, and I apologize for that. Uh, carrying over to calcium, if you have a bunny in renal failure, just be aware that your bunny is going to need protein. Um, you don't, but at the same time, you don't want to put too much protein in them, so you're going to have to make a balance that way. And again, treatment is going to be palliative, because we don't want to put too much of a nitrogen burden on them. So I apologize for running over, um, but thank you for your attention.